Um, today's speaker uh, has degrees from University of Illinois and University of Arizona. He practiced in Tucson, Arizona in the office of Rick Toy Architects. And he is now a partner of Woodhouse Tanucci Architects in Chicago. Um, in addition to that and many other things that we're going to hear about, he is also the curator of the Rear Studio here at IIT. So welcome Andy Tanucci. You guys are too generous. <laughs> I've never been introduced for a lecture like that. I always just stand up and give a lecture. <laughs> Actually, it makes me a little bit more nervous. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is this is interesting because um, this is an opportunity for me to craft a path that it, that doesn't directly relate to your career. Um, we've seen several lectures this semester thus far by prominent architects, and the one thing that strikes me is that with each of them, I'd love to be able to tell them, do you know you're teaching, uh, talking at an architectural school, right? Uh, you know that you're talking to open-minded uh, students who are here to learn, and I feel like, I feel like they're not teaching potentially as, as well as they could. I mean, I, I think they're lecturing phenomenally well. I think they're gifted lecturers, <laughs> gifted professionals. But um, so while the term ideology might be defined as autobiography, I think that's a pretty hard connection for you guys. To make. And I think it's impossible to give a lecture without being autobiographical. I hope that narrative plays a gigantic role in what we do. And I think that's why that's the title of this, this lecture. But I would also like to maybe teach you a few silly things about something that doesn't relate to architecture either. Um, so this is, this is me, okay? My, th th this, these quotes are quotes that I read maybe a long time ago that I made a decision to try and embody. And I try and teach this way, and I try and live this way. And so while Lou Kahn's quote is specifically about architecture, mine is just more about a uh, general place of being, and that is just to say that I don't actually know exactly where I'm going. Um, I have an extremely open mind about it. I know what I like. I know what I feel strongly about. And um, I try to just explore things deeply that fulfill those objectives. Additionally, and I mean a lot of you know me, a lot of you know me pretty well actually at this point. Some of you don't, which is cool too. But I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about the act of doing something as a, uh, opposed to kind of the object that's created at the end of it. Doing is so much more fun than, than looking at what you did. M making is what I do. Um, and, and understand too that, that the title of this lecture is, is not purely architectural. I mean, I'm making a life. I'm making a life for myself. I'm making a life for uh, my wife. I'm making a life for my kids. I'm, I'm playing a role in making more lives too, which, which is something I really um, feel like a deep responsibility to. Um, and then also, too, right after I say that this isn't a lecture specifically about architecture, uh, there's architecture in everything. And I look for it in everything. And I, there's not anything that I look at that I don't relate back to. And you guys hear me talk about this a lot too, this conversation about scale. Scale is size in the scale of the human body. But, but scale is also the scale of an idea or uh, the scale of a path. And I, I always am measuring myself and you against everything else that I possibly can. And, and that doesn't mean I have more capacity. I'm not the smartest person you've ever met. Not even close, but, um, but I do a good job of, of being relative. Um, so, mixed in. Um, this act of making for me, this act of making my path, this open source is, um, an act of mixing a lot of different things. Okay, I could, I'm, I, I really like golf, um, so I could talk to you about golf. And it's funny because, I'll, because I don't like golf actually for the uh, 
act of playing golf. I like golf because I like being outside. I like walking. I like thinking about the design of golf courses. But I don't need to sit here and talk to you about golf. Because uh, that's, uh, that's maybe a little bit further away from something I can try to stitch together in an hour. Um, but I've tried, actually, to create that circuitous path of a conversation today. And uh, it involves um, it involves my family, my wife, Ian, my, my daughter, Isabel, and Olive, um, my practice, or if not specifically, my current practice, because I don't need to just sit here and show you the portfolio of my work. Um, at least the idea that um, it's an enormous part of my life, my previous work, my current work. Um, your work, the work that you do here, and the work that we do together here, and then some of my, some of my hobbies, which include uh, baking. Um, I, I say this a lot to my studio. I, it never, for me, turns off, this conversation. Um, I, I go home from work, and really I haven't gone home from work. Uh, I never left school. I never left uh, my family. I'm just going to a different location. Um, so for me, it's not an act of starting one thing and stopping another. It's a constant act of mixing these things together. And that really is, just as I've described it, it's really just putting a bunch of stuff together to form one. And that, that one can be described as a lot of different things. So um, it relates, of course, to architecture. And, and I only bring this slide up initially because this is where this conversation about cooking comes from. If you guys know that I like cooking, it's because at the start of the spring semester, um, years ago, I started talking about how, the, how concrete and my relationship to concrete's compelling to me because it, it mimics my relationship to, to cooking and food. And this act of making architecture from this material where I can change these, variable, these variables uh, in incremental measures to deliver different performative performances um, is really compelling to me. So I, I add more water to concrete, I make it weaker. I add uh, more, a different kind of Portland cement to concrete, I change the color of it. I change the form work of, of concrete and, and I can give it a different uh, texture in, in the way that sunlight hits it and then you react to it. And this is a lot like, um, this is a lot like food to me uh, because, these, because the act of, of cooking for me really is this act of making and, and then tor towards an end, which is kind of testing what you've made. Again, it's not so much that eggplant caponata is my favorite dish, it's not. Eggplant caponata is really uh, a fun thing for me to make because it's a bunch of different ingredients that come together, to cheap, that, that come together in a way that's completely different from uh, its individual pieces. So the sum is maybe not different than its individual parts, but the sum I'm sorry, the sum is not greater necessarily than, this, than the kit of parts, the individual parts, but, but it's different, and you get to look at it different. This is this conversation of, of being relative. So when I think about eggplant caponata, which for, if you don't know, is just a, like an appetizer. It's a, it's a kind of little side um, condiment that you might spread on, on bread or um, eat as an appetizer before a meal, is, is really just these ingredients eggplant, onion, garlic cloves, tomatoes, red wine vinegar. But this is not just something to be read and then mixed. It's something to be contemplated for me in that I think about these ingredients and I think about, okay, eggplant, what is eggplant and, and what kind of taste does it have and what kind of texture do it have? Onion, garlic cloves. And you start to break these things down into groups of flavors potentially. So, you know, vinegar adds some acidity. Basil might add some sweetness. Tomatoes might add sweetness. Uh, capers might add saltiness, and you think about all these ingredients coming together into this into this outcome, and it provides me an opportunity for measure in that I make this dish frequently because I like it, and every time I make it, I contemplate how I can change it slightly and, and measure the results against itself, or its previous version of itself, uh, so that I can kind of move it forward. Like I'm not changing a dialogue that any of you necessarily care about, but I'm changing a dialogue in some way. I'm committing to changing a body of knowledge. Um, this, the same is true of, of bolognese uh, meat sauce, which is a, a traditional meat um, sauce for, uh, uh, an a traditional Italian meat sauce that's made of a variety of meats. It's called uh, bolognese because it's from Bologna, and uh, 
it's it's often made with uh, at least like four different types of meat. So uh, veal, uh, lamb, beef, pork, uh, and often different versions of different cured versions of it. So you can have like prosciutto or pancetta. Um, <coughs> But it's this process of distilling these ingredients down to come to this flavor, which is what's really compelling to me. It's a, it's a actually several day long process if you're really going to commit to it, which I, which I think is a, a cool commitment to make. Um, really, better cooking and better food and better architecture and better life is not one that's accelerated, but one that sort of is given the amount of time it needs to develop. We say this in class, we say, don't hurry, I don't want you to stay up all night to get something done tomorrow because it's going to suck tomorrow. It's going to be really bad. Um, but if you think about it as a long arc, if you think about working something long enough until it really gets good, now you've done something that you're proud of. So with a, with a simple, silly meat sauce, or it's a very complex meat sauce, I guess I would say, you start with the meat, and you brown the meat. And the act of browning has chemical reactions that changes things. Um, you then have in a separate pot uh, onions and carrots and celery, um, which is called a uh, Oh, no, I lost the slide, it'll come. Which is called a mirepoix, which is another kind of side thing that's happening. Then these things come together, and then you add, say, like wine. And you don't put wine and tomatoes and blah, 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 blah. You don't put it all in a pot. You actually have to let these things have their own kind of reactions and processes before you combine them. So there's kind of time involved. There's a, a really compelling interaction diagram that happens as, in the act of making. So you pour in wine, and it reduces, like you, you boil it down, or you simmer it down until the wine is gone. It's almost entirely dry. And then you add the tomatoes, and then that comes down again. And um, this, is a, this too is a series of ingredients that you can, can think about. Um, but what I love about these things is that, what I love too about these is that some of these foods taste better the day after. Um, and they do, on, they do actually for chemical reasons, which are compelling, and, and that's how some of these things become multi-day uh, events, where you can actually uh, start the day before your preparations and improve the outcome uh, through that act of planning, through that act of mixing. Um, and the way that works, of course, is that you cook something, and it's still, while it's hot, it, it, there's still chemical reactions happening. And you can eat it, and it's as good as the chemical reactions that have happened. And at that point, there's been a lot, so it's going to taste uh, probably pretty good. But if you then let it sit, and let those chemical reactions kind of resolve themselves, and then bring it back, the flavors can be even more complex and have more depth. Um, sometimes when you ask yourself, why does food taste better at a restaurant? Uh, I should say most of the time when you ask yourself why food tastes better at a restaurant, it's because they add a shit ton of salt and butter. So watch out for that. <laughs> but other reasons are because just the act of running a restaurant and making food requires them to prep things in advance. Because when you order it, you're not prepared to wait eight hours to get your bolognese meat sauce. So they have to have had it made. So when you make it at home and it's not quite as good as when you made it in a restaurant, that's not because you're not as good at cook. Sometimes it's just because um, you don't know as many tricks. So then, this is true also, of course, of concrete. And for those of you that have heard that concrete lecture, you know this. Um, and hopefully all of you know this, but it's not a bad refresher ever. But this is the chemical reaction that happens uh, as concrete, as Portland cement hydrates. And does everyone know my little thing about the Portland cement molecules? Does everyone know why Portland cement is strong? Portland cement is, are these molecules, okay, that like this. And when they touch water, chemical reactions happen and they crystallize like this. So when you have two Portland cement molecules next to each other and they crystallize and then they harden, they're very strong because they're locked together. They grab hold of each other, this interconnected network of crystals. And this is to say then you add rock, which is also strong. This is You only add rock necessarily because Portland cement's expensive and you don't want to have so much Portland cement. But say you have too much water. So if I've got one water molecule in between two Portland cement molecules, they can reach around. I need the water molecule to coat it, uh, to get it to hydrate, and it can reach around that water molecule in between and still be strong. But when I add too much water, if I add two water molecules and then have two Portland cement molecules and they try and hydrate, they barely touch each other at all, and I can just break them apart. And this is why too much water makes concrete not very strong.
there's the crystalline structure of it. So concrete then leads me back, way, way back, to some of my earliest memories and probably you know, the reason why I'm an architect. I come from this family of builders. And I can remember building this patio with my great-grandfather, who was an immigrant mason from Pisa. And, and I can remember, and I don't remember that much uh, from my childhood, in fact, but I can remember being there with him, and I can remember him asking me uh, kindly to get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> And then also kindly to like run and fetch him this or run and fetch him that as he poured these things. And I think that my, I think that my love affair with making and material stems from this. And clearly he had an influence on my grandfather, who's also an architect. Um, and his, his grandkids, my dad and his brother, who are builders. Um, so again, there's a lot of things that mix together to describe this path for me. But this was a this was the fact that I remember this. I think suggests the value that it has to me. And then fast forward, you know, many years later, to an opportunity I had to build out in Tucson, where I where we were both the architects and the builders. And here I was pouring concrete again. And now I had to, I didn't. I'm just the architect. Uh, but I'm managing construction because of this design build process that we were running out in the middle of nowhere, you know, I mean like 30 miles from Mexico, uh, literally in the middle of nowhere in this incredible, beautiful landscape. And, and Rick said to me, he said, okay, go, there's a concrete pour tomorrow, go out there and make sure it's perfect. And perfect is a strange, strange, messed up word. Uh, strange is a really, really, word, is a word that I really, really struggle with. Um, because I, I have a, I have a, pretty high standard, I would say, and, and I have also a high degree of responsibility. So when says somebody says to make something perfect, it's like, holy crap, that's not nice. That's like the highest level of achievement. To make something perfect, That's it's a subjective material. I mean, it's this mix of water and cement, and who knows? And, um, that's part of its beauty, is that it's different every single time. So in the act of making this house, I ended up teaching myself a ton about this material. I went out and I bought a book, and I sat there on the job site with this book kind of watching them pour and measuring it back to the book, asking a lot of questions. I think I've never been afraid to ask questions. And then also asking if I could do some of the work. Um, so I had these great experiences where I, through the act of managing the construction, being interested in the construction process, and then wanting to make desperately myself, um, was able to achieve more with the material because of that level of commitment to it. So this is this finished house, fairly simple house with just these two concrete retaining walls that set it down in the earth, so that's why it's low from this side. You descend down into this courtyard here, and the house is shaped by these planes that overlap some concrete, some plaster, some metal. But it was an incredible learning experience for me because, because I really invested it, because I, I didn't just let them do it and um, watch, I engaged with it. I, I let this become something that I took responsibility for making myself, and in doing so, developed a new, a, a new relationship with it. For the sake of time, I don't need to go into all kinds of concrete techniques. Um, but it's a super beautiful house and a super beautiful place that I have this um, love affair with because because of what it taught me. So, not far from Tucson is Phoenix, and this is a long time ago now, this is like somewhere around the 2000, I, I don't know if it was 1998 or 2001, it was some time when I was out there. Um, this restaurant opened in Phoenix, and it's called Pizzeria Bianco, and if you look it up, it's, it's a fairly acclaimed restaurant now. Um, because of this trend that it was must have been at the very, very early part of bringing Neapolitan-style pizza to the United States. So this kind of very traditional technique of, of making pizza. And, and I mean, again, I think, you know, I talk about pizza a lot. So you guys think that I have some expertise in it. But, but rewind 15 years, and I mean, I, I love pizza. I mean, who doesn't like pizza? But I didn't know, I didn't think of pizza as being something that I could ever equate to an architectural process that I would be engaged in. 
But then I, I came here, and it was just, I don't know, because I was visiting friends at a, another office in Phoenix, and we had to go out to dinner, and this place just opened. Um, and they made incredible pizzas. I mean, they made beautiful pizzas. And the flavors were complex, and the structure of the crust was, was incredible, and it was just unconventional, much like the way we talk about architecture. So, I mean, all of your architecture has a roof, right? And it's, so in that way, it's the same as every other piece of architecture. But at the same time, if you can shift someone's perception about something just a little, and get them to dial in just a little to a, maybe a different perspective about something, a light might go off. Uh, a, new, uh, expert, a new kind of intelligence might be gained. And I think that's what happened for me here, is that you know, I had just been eating pizza, and eating pizza. And then I had this pizza that's not genius or not new, and, and it, it's timeless, it's, it's, the, it's the dumbest thing possible, it's just like concrete. Um, but it was in a slightly different uh, arrangement than I had seen it before, and in that way I became compelled. Um, but not nearly so much as I was uh, compelled uh, by the thought of having a family, which is what moved Nina and I back to Chicago from Tucson. Uh, it was the only reason, in fact. Tucson is a beautiful, amazing place, uh, fairly void of culture, which is problematic, um, but full of many other things. That being said, the thought of the thought of having a family and, and mixing that into everything else uh, was, was too much to pass up. And, and the thought of then moving from a place like Tucson, which is way, way out at the edge of everything, back to a really culturally uh, vibrant place like Chicago was was pretty was pretty awesome. So we, we moved back, and shortly thereafter started started our family. And and Isabel was the first one to come along. She now looks like this. <laughs> well, she did look like this, momentarily, briefly. And then when we moved back, of course, pizza looked like this. I was like, oh my god, this is insane. You know, I grew up around here. I grew up in the northwestern suburbs, so I kind of knew what this was, but it had been a while. And this was like, th this is another thing that I really like about pizza. Be honest, is I'm not. A, it's hard to be a snob about pizza. Like being a snob in general is kind of silly. But um, <laughs> but being a snob about pizza is super silly because it's it's just pizza. Um, <laughs> and for those of you that prefer one type of pizza or the other, that's fine to each their own. But you know, to me, the, the cool thing about pizza is that from the very very bottom of the pizza barrel, you know, like the the Domino's or Papa John's of the world, all the way up to the Pizza Biancos of the world. I mean, you're talking about like something that you would still consume in insane volume, really, really fast, <laughs> and have a great time doing it. Um, so this just fits into the mix in a slightly different way. But I will say that it was, again, this, this conversation about this relationship. Oh my gosh, this is all pizza, but man, there's a lot of different types of pizza. What the heck's the difference between all these types of pizza? Um, and, and, and then on a road trip, I went to this, I just happened again to this other pizza place, kind of, so now this, my interests are, are peaked. So now I'm kind of looking for pizza places. And on a trip to Door County, we drove by Sheboygan, and here's El Retrovo, and it's wood-fired pizza. And this is still like before wood-fired pizza was, you know, still before everything was wood-fired pizza. Shit, I make wood-fired pizza. Um, <laughs> So it was like, oh, wood fire pizza, this seems interesting. And we went in, and again, we had this amazing experience eating really, really exceptional, uh, traditional Neapolitan pizza. So, all right, what the heck is, what the heck is pizza now? So now I'm going to kind of dive in. Now I'm like, I've done enough uh, road work, I've done enough field work, now I need to really investigate. Um, and I probably, I probably do the one single thing, this silly, stupid little thing that, is, that has actually changed <laughs> the trajectory of this baking and pizza path of mine. I went online and I bought two live yeast cultures, which I brought for you, <laughs> for you to come see uh, afterwards. And these aren't my only ones, don't worry, I now have five of these jars in my refrigerator. But I bought these two little packets. <laughs> Just dried live yeast cultures that I had to bring back to life. One from uh, Isha Island and one from Kamadoli. 
I haven't quite looked up where those are yet. <laughs> Someday, when I give this lecture again, I'll zoom into the map where Isha Island is, if it's even a real thing. <laughs> and and uh, I'll know then where these things came from. And it, I had to bring them back to life, and there was a set of instructions. So you have to mix it with water and flour, and then you have to keep it exactly 92 degrees for seven days. At which point, you have to check the pH balance by rinsing it and mixing more flour in and water and giving it another seven days, and then it will poof, come to life. So, like 13 days later, I'm like, oh God, this is horrible. I had taken a cooler. I don't have a picture of it. I wish I did, and I couldn't find an example online to take a to, to copy here. But I took a cooler, like a igloo foam cooler, you know, like styrofoam cheap cooler. I inverted it. I poked a hole in it and put a light bulb, a light bulb, like a, a, like a standard A light bulb into it, uh, and then put it on a dimmer switch so that I could control exactly how bright it was, and then I stuck a thermometer into it. Because how do you keep something exactly 92 degrees? Like, I don't know how to do that. So then I had this rheostat dimmer controlling this thing to 92 degrees for seven days while it just sort of sat there and thought about coming to life. Then you rinse it, you do the flour and the water, and, and then finally on the 13th day, I'm like, I'm throwing these damn things out, this is not happening. And on the 14th day, I opened the oven door, because now you had to keep it at like 80 degrees and the oven light keeps it at 80 degrees. And sure enough, it looks like this. And this isn't an exact picture of it. Um, really good architects would lie to you and say, oh yeah, this is exactly what it looks like. I didn't take a picture. Um, I didn't know it was going to be this thing for me. So, and it foams up, it like froths up, it comes to life. So that, that's what's happening, is that the yeast culture is now living. And what it does is it eats flour, and by eating flour, uh, it eats carbohydrates, flour, uh, and, it, it, and it kind of poops out carbon dioxide. It reproduces, which is how it gets sour, because there's more and more and more of them. That's how it starts to taste flour. And it poops out carbon dioxide, which is bubbles. So if you want to know how to make something rise, or why bread rises, it's because the yeast is chewing on the bread, making more of itself to add flavor, and pooping out carbon dioxide to make the thing rise. Then you learn you have to use a special type of flour to make pizza, and only if you use this Italian brown, super fine flour can you really get the proper texture on the crust where it's like a great crunch and uh, on the outside, but then remains kind of soft and chewy on the inside. So then you kind of go to work and you start you start testing. Um, all of these things are more wet than you think they are. So most breads that you're familiar with or that you think you know are dry. You knead the hell out of them. They have to be fairly dry. They shouldn't stick to your hands. This stuff sticks to your hands like crazy. You don't knead it. You can't knead it. Better bread and better dough doesn't uh, is not dry. It's wet. Uh, in fact, this is how you get it to rise more and how you get there to be more bubbles in it. You're essentially making this foam. Okay, so you mix the ingredients together. Then you do something called autolyse, or it does something called autolyse, where if you imagine, again, water molecules and flour molecules, and now super, super fine grain flour molecules all clump together because they're coated with water. You need to give it time for that water to actually go inside and coat all the little fine flour molecules. So you mix it, and then you let it sit. So you mix it for a few minutes, like five minutes, and then you let it sit for 20 minutes, and then you mix it for five minutes, and then you let it sit for 20 minutes. So before you even think about letting it start to ferment, you have to kind of let it get wet, and that takes a while. This is what most people, I think, don't like about cooking in general. It takes too long. But life takes a long time, and I'm kind of in for the long haul, so, so I play with it. Um, <laughs> So here's what it looks like after the first 20 minute wait. Like kind of looks exactly the same. But the texture does definitely change. You will see it change. It kind of relaxes, it kind of slumps. It turns into something else. A picture can't really describe it, and I didn't bring that for you today. But do it once and you'll see and you'll be amazed. Mix it once for five minutes, touch it, feel it, mess around with it. Let it sit for 20 minutes. Mix it again, touch it, feel it, play with it. Totally different, incredible. Just the act of letting that water really get inside to coat all those super fine molecules. All right, now you let it ferment. So the fermentation process is the live yeast process. This is the process where you're giving the yeast time to eat. It's eating. It's, uh, its byproduct is carbon dioxide, so bubbles, and then more of itself reproducing. So that's what's giving it flavor. So these things, you've heard of sourdough. 
These are not sourdough starters. I can make sourdough, star sourdough bread with these, but these are not sourdough starters. These are living organisms. These are live yeast cultures. They're one and the same thing to many people. I'm just giving you the specific uh, definition so that you know the difference. Call it a sourdough starter if you want, but you can make a whole lot more than just sourdough with it. You let it ferment. All right, so you're letting it start to grow, you're letting it relax, because as it's chewing, it's having chemical reactions and changing the makeup of that bread. My first few attempts, you know, they make pretty good pizza. The crust is okay. It's, you know, it's not as, it's not as pretty as I'd like it to be, but it's pizza, you know, so it's, it's fine, I'm good with it. And it's not, not bad, you know, not a bad crust and, and, and texture on the inside. It's got a pretty good structure. It just doesn't get that really nice kind of char on the top. Uh, the, the caramelization and the sugars of the sauce haven't really happened. But I'm, I'm kind of on my way. <laughs> so I'm not the guy in Design Studio who asks you to do it 20 times. I'm not that guy. I know you're not going to do it 20 times. But I'm, I am the guy who actually does it 20 times. Uh, or more. Or a lot. That's me. And I'm not ever going to stop. And every time I, I, not every time I do it, because at some point you've done it enough where you've run the gamut, I, I guess I would say. But I, I like to experiment and I love to make. And I want to continue to measure this process against itself. Um, I don't know how I'll feel about it in two years, let alone five years, let alone ten years. But for right now, it's still something I'm pretty enthusiastic about. So, so yeah, so you make a little spreadsheet <laughs> and you write down your recipes. And you, you measure, here's, here's really where you could focus just up here. I don't know if it's even legible to you, but flour, water, starter, and salt. Um, the basic ingredients of any kind of bread. Starter being the live yeast culture. And you look at the percentages here. And what's interesting about the percentages uh, is that you're talking about, um, you're actually talking about levels of hydration, just the way you're talking about with concrete. Okay, this doesn't have anything to do with weight. I mean, it has to do with weight because weight ultimately is how you can measure these things. But it's not like, a, I meant to say it doesn't have anything to do with volume. Uh, what you really need to do is get the amount of water right relative to the amount of starter to the amount of flour. Because just like concrete, it's food for the yeast and it's molecules that are pushing and pulling things apart that are going to change its final relationship to each other. It's actually zero difference from concrete, except in how the results turns out. Okay, so I'm working on the recipe, I'm working on the dough, but I can't get the oven hot enough. I can't get enough uh, caramelization on the pizza. I can't get enough char on the bread. I can't get enough caramelization on the ingredients, so I need more heat. So I'm reading. How do I get more heat? My oven is only 550 degrees. One way is to hot wire my oven and make it so that I can put it on a clean cycle, cleaning cycle that's like super high temperature without having to lock it and being able to access it. I don't want to rake my oven, okay? I don't have, I'm not so into this that I need a second broken oven that could potentially be a fire hazard. But if I cook on a sheet of steel, instead of on a pizza stone, the steel will transfer its contained heat faster to the pizza, to the bread, than the stone will. This is a simple thing for you guys to understand. The wires in your house are copper, they're not clay. Energy transfers faster through metal than it does through stone. So, get a piece of steel. They sell these now, they're called baking steels. The whole, the whole range, like this is, this is all pretty common knowledge, depending on how much time you want to sit on blogs. But you take your pizza steel, you put it on the top shelf of your oven and you turn on the broiler. And you leave that on as high as your broiler will go for an hour. So that the oven is hot, really, really hot, and the steel is hot and there's a flame right above the pizza. And you slide the pizza off onto the thing and it, it does pretty good. It starts to get some of that char on the crust. Um, here's a thing that, this is, this is the people who sell the steel. They'll show you this on the internet, they saw this. Uh, so a pizza stone, the bottom of it will look like this, 450 degrees, 10 minutes. The baking steel, 450 degrees in three minutes. I haven't confirmed these results. So I'm just now marketing for baking steel. <laughs> uh, and then the wood fire looks like this. And I, don't, I guess I really don't know what the difference between these two things is. Maybe actually what they're saying is this is better than wood-fired pizza steel. Um, 
so anyway, yeah, you get the pizza steel and you're kind of you're feeling good about yourself, but still the top of it's not quite right. It still takes like three or four minutes to cook, and you really want to be able to cook these things in about 90 seconds. So you start talking to the owners of restaurants like around here that cook good pizza. So Spacanopoli, um, really nice guy who owns the place, and you start talking to him, and you start, you know, like, he gets this all the time, you walk up to him, and you're like, look, I make pizza at home. <laughs> and, um, and I was asking him, you know, like, how hot is your oven? 800 degrees. I can cook the pizza in 90 seconds. It's like, I'm making an oven that can get to 800 degrees. <laughs> and the only way I can get an oven to 800 degrees is with fire. So I'm gonna make a wood fire oven, but I don't have any idea how to do this. Um, and you, they weren't just selling them online. So I started making it up. So I put down bricks, and this one didn't work. This one didn't have near the volume. I never got this thing higher than about 200 degrees. I couldn't build a big enough fire in it um, to warm it up. This one, though, this one worked. So this is just bricks that you collect or you buy. It's totally demountable. It's not fixed. It goes down in the winter if you can get it down. It goes over to your friend's house if you want it to go over to your friend's house. Um, and you just stack these things up and you make this long tube. It's not domed. I wish it was domed because that would reflect the heat towards the center, which is what commercial wood-fired ovens do. Uh, it's not big, so you slide the pizza in one at a time and then you have to spin the pizza because one side of it's always getting burned. Um, but you put the fire in and you let the thing heat up for about an hour and a half and then you push the fire to the back. It's this long tube and the bricks now have retained all this heat. Thermal mass is really good because it's just hot and it just radiates heat from everywhere to this thing, from below, from the sides, from above. 800 degrees and you slide the steel in, so now I'm best of both worlds, right? I'm like super awesome on the bottom and I'm super awesome on top. <laughs> And you slide it in, and then you hope like hell that you can get that thing spun around before the back and burn it. Yeah, that's right. You gotta buy welding gloves, you gotta buy a little laser thermometer so that you can prove to everybody that you can actually have an oven that's 800 degrees on the bottom. It's actually 1,000 degrees on the top. And you just go to town making pizzas. And it's pretty awesome. I mean, it makes a killer pizza. I don't, I don't think it's any better or any worse than Pizza Bianco or Il Retrovo or Pizza Hut or anywhere, but um, <laughs> but it's it's fun. It's fun and it represents like something that I did, something that I made, and something that I'm enthusiastic about. It has this social effect, obviously, right? Like this is this is my shtick now. Who would have thought that my shtick would be making pizzas or being able to go out back and, and make pizzas for you guys then at the end of the year, which we now do I don't know how long running, two or three years running. Um, Tom, I told you I'd call you off. Tom to this day is the first person who's ever made dough, brought it out as you're all invited to when we have our cooking party and made pizzas with us. So thanks Tom for doing that, that's a ton of fun. And this sucker's double wide, so there's enough bricks here to get two layers of brick all the way around. And it's bigger, which is awesome. And this sucker gets really hot. In fact, I learned that you can get an oven too hot. Um, so you can really fry a pizza fast. Because you put it in and it just puffs up and you just gotta spin it around and sure enough in 90 seconds you're done. You can make killer pizzas. Here's where it's burned, see? So it's usually a little more burned on one side than the other, but that side's for that side's for me. I'll take that side. Alright, so narrative turns into education. So the thing that makes Bread, bread, uh, gives bread its flavor. This browning that happens, the burning effect, is something called the Maillard reaction. It's a French term, French chemist came up with it. Um, it's what happens when heat reacts with proteins, amino acids. So you've got sugars and proteins reacting together with heat, and they brown. They change chemically their structure. That's what turns them brown. Obviously, what gives them the taste. You can take a Maillard reaction too far. You can burn the crap out of something. It doesn't taste so good anymore. But if you control the burn just a little bit, that's what gives it that aroma and that characteristic. <laughs> this is true when you're cooking a steak. You take a steak, because it's all protein, and you slap it down, and you get that crust on it. That's the Maillard reaction in protein. It happens in bread, happens in meat, happens in proteins with heat. But that's what's, the, that's what's characterizing the flavor. That's the chemical process that characterizes the flavor of making bread. Okay, so. Mixing back. In the winter, the pizza oven sucks. 
yeah. it's kind of useless. Because it's out there, it doesn't have a door, it's outside, it's zero degrees out, it's snowing, so it's really uncomfortable for me. And trying to get an oven to be up 800 or 1,000 degrees when it's zero out versus 100 out or, or 70 out is a totally different thing. It's got an open mouth on it, so sometimes even on a nice day, if the wind's blowing the wrong direction, I can't cook pizza because the wind just blows into the thing. Uh, so I've made a little door for it too, but even then, <laughs> It's kind of a, it's like another piece of stone that folds up in front of it. One of the pictures you can see, he was looking over the stone. So in the winter, um, I got I kind of started missing pizza. Um, yeah, and I can go to Pizza Hut or I can go to uh, a place and buy pizza, but I like making stuff. So what the hell am I going to do with these things? Because they just they just uh, they just sit in the refrigerator. So yeah, I can make uh, desserts for the holidays, which is awesome. And instead of the Maillard reaction, I can do caramelization, which is sugars and heat uh, versus proteins and heat. And it tastes awesome, um, but it doesn't really satisfy your craving for bread. Um, and these guys, they just sit and get lonely in the fridge. And they just camp out there dormant like this. And this whey comes up off of them, this liquid comes up off of them. So what am I going to do? I guess I'm going to have to figure out something to do with these things. So I start reading about making bread. Also, totally stupid, totally dumb, four ingredients, there's not much to it. You have to take these things out every once in a while and feed them, because if you let them go dormant too long, they'll even super slowly eat and reproduce themselves to death. They'll start to eat themselves, they will spoil themselves and die. So even if you're not doing anything with them in your refrigerator, you gotta let them, every few months, you gotta take them out, you gotta feed them water and flour, you gotta let them chew on it, you gotta let them come back to life. And it works just like this, equal parts. Culture, flour, water. My ratio is pretty simple, 100 grams. 100 grams of starter, 100 grams of flour, 100 grams of water. Mix it into this thing. I did it this morning, so you can see. These have been, I brought these out a couple days ago so that you can see. And you can see the bubbles inside. So these are growing. They've been kind of bouncing around in the car, so they've settled a little bit. But if 300 grams gets you about here, they'll eat and chew until they're out of the food, until this gets almost all the way up to the top. So 300 grams is my sweet spot for not overflowing the, the jar. Although you can see I don't do a terrific job of it because the jars are a mess. Um, and you know, just like sometimes your first architectural passes, your first attempts at bread are not that good. Um, this was bread, it was flour, it was yeast, and it was water, but it, 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 it didn't look that good, it was kind of dry. This was me thinking, oh, I can just knead the heck out of it and, and turn it into bread. It's bread. I mean, it equals bread, its definition is bread. But it's not really what I was looking for. Um, so I guess I've kind of already covered that, but that's the diagram I found online of how yeast eats. Oh yeah, right, this process too, of course, because this same thing could be used to make beer Right, the it's also producing um, alcohol if you change the content. Right, you don't make beer with a, a ton of flour; you make beer with much more sugar. Um, so here's the conversation about the kneading. When you knead something, what you think you're doing is you're mixing the bread. You're kind of you're you're organizing. Everybody knows what gluten is. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Gluten, you've heard of gluten. People have gluten uh, allergies. Um, Gluten is the complex kind of organized strands of protein that form in bread. They're just like strings. They look like this. Gluten is a mix of these two products uh, that, that occur in, in flour, in the, uh, the germ of flour. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce them, so I won't. But there's these two components, and when they mix together with the water, they start to organize. When you knead them, you change their structure and you organize them into kind of this linear bound strand. This is not strong, this is not strong. But when you mix these two things together, these little strings get tough. So that when you then take this mix and you fill it up with carbon dioxide and bubbles, it rises. That's why it rises. The air doesn't just escape from it, like foaming, frothing water or something like that. It carries the structure up into the loaf. When you knead it, you're doing that. You're effectively organizing that structure. Kneading's not such a bad thing, except in order to knead, you need for the dough to be much less wet. 
And water is actually a good thing when you're making bread because wetness equals steam. Steam is humidity to the bread, so it keeps the bread really moist. So this bread here, despite it additionally not rising, is also crazy dry. It's just dry. It's not that tasty. It's dry. So I need more moisture in it too. You can't knead super moist bread because it'll just stick to your hands. It's just loose and organized. But you still need these strands to develop. So how do you do that? The way you do that is you do slow ferment. So this is where we come back to this conversation about time. If you need bread for dinner tonight, you're screwed. It's not gonna happen. Go out and buy some. If you need bread in three days, you're still in good shape. You can cover, you can cover that. I can lend you some starter. Um, so what happens in a slow ferment is you mix these ingredients together. I'll show you the steps. It, through the act of the yeast, chewing on the flour and reproducing, will organize these strands for you. You stretch the dough a little bit, you fold to incorporate air, and it will organize these strands for, for you if you give it enough time to do that. The way you do that and, pro and prolong the fermentation is you keep it cool. So instead of putting it in a warm place, you put it like in a refrigerator. You put it on your back porch in the winter. You put it in a cooler that's kind of about a measured temperature. If you can keep it below 80 degrees, if you can keep it about 68 degrees, this can just ferment and ferment and ferment for 24, 36 hours, and you develop incredibly complex flavors. Because before these things go sour, right? Sour just means that they've reproduced so many times that they no longer taste good. Like, one of them is super, super mildly sour. Two of them, slightly more. Three of them, slightly more. If they reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce, now you have sourdough. But if you let them just eat slowly, super slowly, they reproduce really slowly. So you can make bread that's strong, full of water, so moist, and not overly sour because they haven't reproduced so much, that looks like this. And you can, you know, if we microscopically zoomed in here, you would see gluten strands being supported and kind of pushed out by expanding pockets of carbon dioxide, that's the byproduct of the, of the yeast, and the steam, the water, that as it heats and you bake it, expands and puffs the loaf of bread. All right, so here's how simple it is. It's all in grams again, because you have to measure it with a scale. Uh, it's not volume based, it's all about hydration. It's all about getting the water to equal the flour content. It's really, there's nothing to it. Um, I will say that the, that because there's nothing to it, there's very little that's giving it flavor. Salt gives it flavor, the yeast gives it flavor, the culture gives it flavor, I mean to say, and the flour gives it flavor. So much flour that we use now, white flour, has been drained of anything that tastes like anything, that it can be a somewhat mild, uh, you know, less than super flavorful bread. So I, I would absolutely recommend, and I have now gone out and looked for all kinds of different flours. I'm not talking about wheat flour. I'll show you the picture. Sorry. I'm not talking about wheat flour. Wheat flour, here's the wheat grain, okay? Kernel of wheat, wheat berry. It's got the bran, which is the husk around it. It's kind of like hard little protective coating. It's got the endosperm. This is the white flour part. White flour that you have is just this part of the flour sifted and sifted and sifted to the finest grain so that all the other stuff is gone. Then you have the germ. This is the tasty stuff here. If you grind this whole thing up, you have whole wheat flour. You've got the bran, the germ, the endosperm, okay? If you grind this up and remove the bran, but leave some of the germ, you still got bread flour. You still got white bread flour, but it's not perfectly white. It's not totally bleached, and it tastes a million times better. Um, go to a farmer's market and look at their bag of bread flour, and it's not totally white. It's kind of tan. That's the kind of bread flour that's nice to add in. So it's expensive, more expensive. Like instead of 50 cents a pound, you can buy bread flour for $7 a pound. That's ridiculous. Um, it doesn't taste any different. I've done it. But if you buy a little bit up for a nice bread flour and mix it in, say, half and half or two-thirds white flour, one-third nicer bread flour, you can still make a really, really tasty loaf of flour. All right. So you mix the stuff together. I'm running out of time. I'm not I'm like only halfway through. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to. Um, I could be only halfway through. Um, so you mix it and you let it sit. You let it auto lice. So it's just hydrating itself. The, the yeast is starting to chew and eat. Then you do this stretching and folding technique. So you keep it in a bowl, you keep, paper, you keep a towel that's wet over the top of it, and then you just stretch it out. What's this doing? This is taking those gluten strands that are kind of all mixed up and then just straightening them out into strands when you stretch. And then you fold it over to incorporate air. 
stretch, pull, and you'll see it change. It's awesome. It goes from being this thing, here, you can even see it. These aren't my pictures. You can see it. It goes from being almost a puddle of dough to actually being something that has structure. Just in that act of pouring it out, stretching it, folding it, stretching it, folding it. By the third stretch, you can't stretch it anymore because it's strong. You've organized those gluten strands, and now they have structure. You do this for the first ferment of as long as you want, depending on how cold it is. Two days, uh, four hours, doesn't really matter. Then you need to shape it into your loaf, okay? So you need to organize the gluten strands again. You don't ever need it, because when you need it, you're gonna push all the air out of it. You're gonna deflate it substantially. So you just stretch the gluten over itself. You kind of cut it up into its four loaves, you stretch it over the top of itself. That organizes and straightens the gluten strands into strands around it, like this. You dump it, you invert it into a bowl, and then you let it ferment again for this time, much less. You could do it for longer, but you don't need to. This time, for much less. All you need to do is get the yeast kind of working again and active again. And then you cook. So before you cook, you dump it out. Now this thing that's been inside of a bowl, you dump it out. Now it's got a dome shape. You have to slice the top of it. Do you guys know why you slice the top of bread? What's that? You slice through the top of it because you want for that to give the gases, the steam and the gases, some place to escape. Because if you don't, that gluten surface over the top will puff up. I've got a picture of it, I thought it was nice. It will puff up and separate from the bread itself. You've seen this, the bread that you cut into, and like the crust is way up here, and then the bread is way down here. It's because it wasn't sliced. You need to give that steam some place to escape to. Where's that picture? Here, like that. So you slice it, the gas has a place to go, but not it can't all get out, so that forces the bread to rise, but it keeps the bread and the crust together. Some people like this, I don't really care for this. But this is what you get. You can even make cool little designs. This is what it comes down to now. I've been reduced to just the designs I can make on top of the bread. Um, you can make different types of bread, obviously. Uh, but it's really just the same thing, it's still just, a, it's still just an aesthetic thing. Um, sometimes you let it sit too long on the second ferment and when you invert it, it sticks to, because it's so wet, it sticks to whatever you lined the bowl with. If it sticks, you're in trouble because now you've kind of like cut it and you've deflated it and that's a much flatter look. So you got to really work on, on not cutting it. Um, but you can make a pretty good little part. The last little trick, though, comes from, and I push it here because I was gonna go somewhere else with this talk before I realized that we only had an hour to talk. The humidity and keeping the humidity on the bread is really a key component of it. You can just invert it onto a pizza stone and bake it. You'll make a nice loaf of bread. It'll rise, it'll brown, it'll be nice. But the thing that really separates from me bread is that texture of the crust compared to the inside of it. So if the crust has got like a, a crunch but also a chew to it, and then inside has that texture that's moist but still something you can bite through, that's like the kind of bread that I really like. And the way you do that is through humidity. So a commercial convection oven has a humidity injection system. So when you go to a, a bakery and they've got a huge oven that can hold 15, 20 loaves of bread at a time, that thing is injecting moisture into the oven while it bakes giving that crust the kind of texture that it needs. So you're kind of adding moisture and removing moisture constantly to that crust. It's like tempering glass, where you bake the glass a second time, you change its surface characteristics. If you can cook in a Dutch oven, you can do this. So if you have a Dutch oven, you can invert the loaf of bread into the pan or into the bowl of the Dutch oven, slice it, and then cover it, and then cook it halfway. And in cooking it halfway, it steams itself. It just inflates in this steamed environment, and then you, for the second half, pull the lid off, bake it the rest of the way, and it will brown, or the Maillard reaction will occur on the surface of it, and finish off that texture on the surface. That's the, that's the latest and best trick that I've learned. So 
So yeah, this is hyperlinked. Humidity and thermal mass. I seriously was going to do it. I was going to go <laughs> to the desert and talk about how it connects to round earth and mixing. Um, and I should have really put a hyperlink back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I had uh, the, the so close. But I didn't want to um, end without at least mixing in Olive, who's, who's uh, number two, my number two daughter, as she calls herself. <laughs> so she came second. And for those of you who are <laughs> children, you know yourself better than I do. But you're all the same in some ways. But she's a she's a sweetheart, and the the thing that I would just say and, and show you is in terms of mixing is how <laughs> how Olive, who was born on Halloween, has found a way for us to mix in uh, our creative energies and our uh, family processes and love for each other to um, to like turn this into an even bigger mix, where if you know us and it's Halloween and your game. Uh, you're involved. So, and we don't mess around when it comes to Halloween. <laughs> but I, I would say I don't really mess around uh, much with anything. I, I, I kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff that he's gotten into. Uh, that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs>